BioBalance HealthCast episode 221, Bioidentical Hormone Pellet Therapy is Safe and Effective. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. This is Dr. Kathy Maupin and I'm Brett Newcomb and we are talking this week about some of the challenges and frustrations that Kathy faces when patients come to see her uh, who have other physicians who reject, fail to understand, don't embrace or support the work that Kathy does because you set up a dynamic in that situation then where there's sort of conflicted messages that the patient receives from different physicians that he or she respects and is trusting to help them get their their health better and their lives better. And when these two physicians aren't on the same page, that can create static in the life of the patient that's really painful. And some of uh, what Kathy has heard from her patients, there are physicians who have said, Dr. Maupin's treatment is going to kill you. You're going to die <laughs> if you take Me. this treatment. That's a pretty overwhelming statement had, from and a physician. That, that, that physician had no idea what I was doing. Right. I, mean, I mean, didn't even know what hormones I was giving or my protocols, didn't ever ask me, never called me, never anything, just in his head decided that hormones kill you. Well, being a member of a, a mass media culture with limited personal information, the physician probably is aware of the the lawyer ads for people who take <laughs> testosterone mm -hmm. that say you may be able to get rich off of this because that people have died, uh, they've had strokes, they've had heart attacks, blah blah blah. And if that's all you've ever heard and you haven't done any research and you don't have any information, but your patient comes in and says, "Oh, I'm going to go do this," you're going to say, "Wait a minute, that's risky. That's like riding a, a motorcycle or a bike without a helmet." Have you noticed that there's a lot? There are fewer ads like that lately because they didn't fly Yeah. because there's no backup for them. So the lawyers come out. I mean, I'm married to one, but this is not the type of law he does. Okay. This is not, I'm not, I'm not being critical how, of him. I am being critical of many lawyers who well, just jump on a bandwagon when they see a headline. They buy the TV space. Right. Who knows how they pay for that? Cause that they're, is so They're expensive. trying to scare patients into their office and they're trying to create class actions. Right. If you get enough patients and you can have a class action, then the attorney's offices classically make millions right. and the individual patients get $32.18. Right. So, you know, so that's so. the key information here. Class action suits, unless you're the one person that's the primary right. person t bringing the class action or the lawyer, you're not going to make, you're going to make pennies. Well, you all so. get letters from like <laughs> Bell Telephone saying, you know, there was class action settled and, and you're going to get 37 cents back right. if you fill out the following 47 pages of paperwork accurately <laughs> and correctly before noon tomorrow. So you get negative money for doing that. <laughs> it's kind of like the publisher's clearinghouse. Yeah. Yeah, you know? it is. But I think they actually... So, do <laughs> so we digress. They, they sell magazines. Okay. So, so, so some patients have been told, if you go do that, it's going to kill you. Do you not understand? But Don't the problem that. is that you, if you are out there and you've been told this, this creates this huge, huge anxiety. anxiety and fear. And, and frustration. And frustration because, Because if I don't a, do this, what else am I going to do? Right. A, the doctor you're right in front of isn't doing anything for you or you wouldn't be coming to see me. Right? right. So... The well, question they're not solving ask, the problem. They're not, well, what I mean is, yeah, they're yeah. not solving the problem that you're coming to see me for. So basically, right. what you should ask that doctor is then exactly what are you going to do for me and how are you going to make me better? And they don't know. Well, let me, let me give an example. I was chatting with some people that I know privately mm -hmm. uh, recently, mm -hmm. and they were upset and frustrated because... Uh, they've been married to someone for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. They love this person. This person has no sexual desire. They don't initiate. They will respond, but more as an accommodation, mm -hmm. you know, because it's an obligatory or it's been, oh, three weeks, sure. Uh, <laughs> Or, yeah, oh, a lot you want, of people you want have that been again, in that position. You know? Yeah, yeah well, been in that position. A lot of people have been in that unequal position. Unequal sexual desire. Right. And so this person says to their partner, I think there's something wrong. We were in a better place. Now we're not in a good place. Go to your doctor and ask, is something wrong? So they go to their doctor, and the doctor says, you're getting old. 
it's normal, uh, it's supposed to happen, it's it's in your head, or it's in your relationship. Maybe or you need it's counseling. a problem with your husband. Or you need a psychiatrist. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, the, but step back true. 10 and punt is basically right. what they do. There's nothing that can be done. You're screwed. Oh, well. Uh, and sure. or, or technically, in this case, you're not, you're not. screwed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So the, this couple is frustrated. What do we do? What do we do? And I offered them our book mm -hmm. because there's a chapter in the book that talks about libido-related issues mm -hmm. and the fact that symptomolo symptomologically, Sim uh, <laughs> some women are anorgasmic, mm -hmm. uh, not because of some personal trauma or some uh, religiously severe doctrine that inhibits sexual expression, but because they don't have enough testosterone. And you mm -hmm. give them testosterone, and suddenly, oh, baby, wow, things are happening that have never happened in their lives, mm -hmm. and they're like new people. Or and we can give them back orgasms that they've lost. If they've lost them, exactly. they come in and, and they go, this is so confusing. I don't feel like myself. I can't, I, I, no matter what I do, I can't have an orgasm. That's that's frightful for some so, people. So I'm talking to this guy who's relating. This is my circumstance. Mm -hmm. And I give him the book, and I tell him I personally have known a dozen or more couples who've mm -hmm. articulated what you've articulated, who've been to see Dr. Maupin, who, and who now say they no longer have those problems, that mm -hmm. that element of their relationship is better. That's that's very com My office is full of people who are sexually happy. <laughs> yeah. And so then the guy looks at me and he says, I don't think she'll go. I don't think she will go. Her doctor says... This is normal. You're getting older. Women lose their sex drives. You know, everybody needs to grow up here and face this, and uh, eventually he'll lose his if too, and he'll quit being a problem. If that wife was saying that, he would not say that, because I've had lots of doctors who, uh, in the 13 years I've been doing this, yeah. have I've heard their criticism through their patients right. of me. The patients still come. Yeah. The patients get better, go back and, and confront their doctor and say, I'm better, and you said I would be. It would be dangerous, and I wouldn't be better, and I am. So they've heard this over and over again, mm -hmm. and then time hits. Time goes along. Their wife loses. They're usually guys. They their wife loses her sex drive, and they're in my office. These doctors who or are their wives saying, or without their... the doctor yeah. are in my office, and and it's very interesting that I know the background. Their wives don't. Their wives don't know that for years they criticized me to their patients or they told patients not to see me, but then their wives are here. So so honestly, you have to bring it home to your doctor. You have to say, if if this was your wife, if your wife was standing in front of you saying, mm, no sex anymore, I'm done, it's over, what would you do? And he, then it brings it back to his own personal needs and his history with his wife, and he he has to then think in those terms instead of thinking clinically, like, oh, I was trained this way. You don't need sex. Well, when he thinks about it for himself, I bet you he does. So bringing it to the doctor and turning it around and saying, what would you do mm -hmm. when, they, when they say that to you may change their point of view, or it may open them up to later change their point of view. But don't let that stop you because... They haven't, they don't know the research. 99.9% .9 of the people have not busy asked doing me for what they any do. information. Yeah, they're busy doing what they do. They're doing it as well and as competently as they can. And, you know, people are afraid of the unknown. People are afraid of things that are different. They're afraid of taking that risk mm -hmm. uh, and, and that leap forward. And so you always try to do what you already know how to do if you can and see if that'll solve mm -hmm. the problem. And, right. And, and frequently, we do it repeatedly knowing it is to solve. I mean, I don't know how many of you have ever had the experience of having a light bulb go out in your house and you go to the wall and you flick the switch when you know the bulb is out and you haven't changed it, but you still go over and flick the switch and light doesn't come on. You're like, oh yeah, I need to change that. Mm -hmm. And then a few minutes later, you flick it again. Where I, where I see that is patients that come to me and then they bring the shopping bag <laughs> of supplements. Yeah. And they say, okay, I'm here to be treated and fixed. Now, tell me of all of these things that I've bought and I take, right. which ones are going to interfere with my treatment, which ones help me, which ones don't help me. So they've gone repetitively back 
to the health food store, back to talk to somebody. In search of the magic bullet. In search of something. And then yeah. they also have a whole bunch of drugs. Right. And they bring in their drugs. And they say, what's going to interfere with your treatment? What? At, or I say, let me see them. Because I want to make sure you're not taking something that's going to be that you bought over the internet from China. <laughs> Right. With ingredients that nobody knows about. Yeah, but, yeah, and that's that's an issue. But but they're trying different things, and they've gone to their doctor, and they've gone to a different doctor, and they've gone to and they've gone to a, I mean, they did what I did. I mean, I went to an endocrinologist, which is supposedly somebody who understands hormones. He said you're getting older. I went to a female endocrinologist, and she said you got to live with it. Uh, I went to a gynecologist. I went to a psychiatrist. I went to all these different people, saying. What is wrong with me? And they all said, you're getting old, 47 year old, too bad. You know, now that I'm 60, 47 was really, really young to say that to somebody. So they say, basically, have you ever had this before? And you say, no, I never have. Well, you got it now. That'll be $100. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, That's all they have to offer. Yeah. And, and or exercise, eat better, starve yourself, whatever. Pray. But none of those things worked. Yeah. Well, prayer worked for me. But that was it. <laughs> and they didn't suggest, not one doctor suggested that. So <laughs> I feel, I sound, I sound like I'm like, be, I'm a traitor to, to my, to, to my own profession. Uh, profession. But yeah. honestly, there are, there are a lot of us who do what I do, but then everybody who closes their mind and doesn't think that anything besides what they learned at residency is out there and have never read anything besides the guidelines from the American College of OBGYN because those are like 20 years behind. I mean, they still, I'm not sure they still believe PMS exists. And, you know, we've known that forever. But they, if that's all they Some read, of them don't. they still say, no, or they don't still say. read, right. then they're in trouble because when I was in residency for OBGYN, sex was never discussed. I mean, we delivered babies. People had to have sex to have babies. We and did. Did you deal with fertility? Yeah. We did the, fertility. The mechanics of the mecha Yeah, but it was it was all something that was just, you know, the sperms goes in here, and then you have to get the swims cervical. Swims upstream, yeah, it's swims, got an 80% yeah, chance. Cervical yeah. uh, mucus has to be good, and then you can do this procedure and that. It was all procedurally right. based, and but no one ever talked about orgasms or, I mean, positioning maybe with women's hips up right. so that right. the semen would go into the cervix, but that's it. That's all I got in residency about sex. Never, I'm not sure orgasm was ever said in four years of residency. So the majority of my time was spent delivering babies and doing GYN surgery and doing pelvic exams and treating STDs. Well, they had to get it somehow, right? So STDs come from sex, but we never really discussed that. Now, in private practice, I did, but I had to read about you had to learn about it. Yeah, I had Where? to learn about it myself because it's not in our training. So if you think your OBGYN's an expert at sex, nope, not unless he personally or she personally has investigated it. I wonder if, if medical training is the way that it is because it's a reflection of a larger cultural phenomenon. I mean, what kind of phenomenon? Well, we, you, you and I were talking about this, and it seems as if. There's a there's a paternalistic approach to medicine and government and everything else. <laughs> yes, in, in our culture, yeah. you know, and we're raised as children to believe or we automatically assume, and it's reinforced that that is correct that our parents know stuff, and that when they tell us stuff, it's right. Mm -hmm. And so your father, if you will, or mother, but you, for the example of paternalism, your father says you can't do this because of that, and you say okay. Uh, or your father says, this is the way that works. And you go to your dad. Dad, enough, why? Dad, why? Dad, why is the sky blue? Dad, how come this happens? Dad, why didn't that happen? Mm -hmm. uh, what makes this work this way? And dad's come up with answers. Yeah, my, my husband used to be great at that until the internet and the iPad and the iPhone. Because yeah. he'd just make up an answer for the kids. Oh, yeah. And they were great they go answers. Off and research it. Right. Yeah. Now... Oh, now he's he's, he's lost half he's of his smart fun funny. stuff. Yeah. I know he's smart and funny. So, I mean, true. But interestingly enough, most men who go into medicine are not personality-wise men who question authority. And most women who go into medicine, or it used to when I was in medical school, were women who were bucking authority. We were always the personality that 
even when my dad would say, well, this is this, I'd be like, right, I think you should tell me how that works because I'm not really believing you until you tell me how it works. Yeah. So that's how those are the personalities that were drawn to medicine as females, at least in the 80s and 90s. I'm not sure about now. Um, my daughter's an example. She's she's like that. So she always wants to know how and why and and wants to know the whole story, not just a little bit. So so it may be that medicine itself has developed a paternalistic view, basically in the in the males, but maybe even in the females, because we're trained by men. I mean, there aren't a lot of women at the top training female doctors. Mm -hmm. Maybe now they're starting to be, but my age group was the first group of women. So paternalism, though, is something that makes us feel good and safe. Yeah. And so that's why we look for it. We look for paternalistic uh, government and doctors because when they say you're going to be fine, then you feel like you're going to be fine. The, the anxiety is relieved and your questions are relieved. So, so the good news is that when I tell somebody they're going to be fine, 95% of the time, I'm, I'm right. I almost they're said 95% of the time, I'm 100% right. But I mean, <laughs> so 95% of the time, I act, the, the patients that come to see me are all better. Not just a little bit. Well, but that's because you pre-qualify your patients. You, you're not a mm -hmm. one-come-all service, and you don't mm -hmm. promise a panacea that's going to fix everything. Mm -hmm. You look at lab tests. You look at medical histories. You communicate with their outside physicians, mm -hmm. which brings us back to our original discussion. There are outside physicians uh, that, will, that have said to their patients, if you go see her, I won't see you anymore. I know, and that's abandonment. That's really scary for patients. And a lot of women that I talk to have waited years. They have suffered years with symptoms. Beyond what they ever should have had Beyond, to suffer. If their doctor had just said, I don't know anything about it, why don't you go see how, you know, what, see, what it is. Yeah, and let's what talk about what she and suggests let's see, or see, how it works right, or, or how what her works. rationale is. Let's get and, some information. And see if you're better. Yeah. But um, well, to, but they don't say that, and to, to, and so they're torturing their patients. And if that's if that's what your doctor said, then send me your lab work. Let me look at it and see if you can be helped or not. Because I don't I don't see people who I can't help. That's very frustrating for everyone involved. Well, it's like people so, that grew up in blended families or divorced mm -hmm. families who now it's time to have a wedding, and the divorced mom says to the daughter, "If you ask your dad to the wedding." then yeah. I won't participate. Right. And it right. puts the patient in an impossible situation. Right. They've come to see you. They feel like what you're doing is helping. They have evidence. I've lost 30 pounds. I've come off of six medicines. I have a sex drive. I'm happy. And then their doctor's saying, nah, it's all quackery. And if you oh, keep it's all it up, in your head. I won't see. Yeah. It's all in your head. You do, you just imagine that you're all better. Well, tell I wish. Story. Tell, tell okay, our, well, our I, had, I, had, I had an amazing, an amazing woman come in for her second visit she had had she'd come in for the first we we talked over everything gave her and I, I treated her with several things besides just pellets she needed thyroid she needed some other things so we sat down after the four months and I said so how are you you know have we succeeded here's your symptoms have, have we succeeded and she's like I'm all better everything that I went she came to you with I'm better I, I went to my doctor with that for years, and she said that I didn't need hormones, that I don't need anything, and so then she said, I went back to see her for my pap smear. She said, interestingly enough, I told her I was better, and I know this physician. In fact, I've known her since she was an intern, and she knows that I'm very careful in surgery and everything else. She knows that I'm very ethical as well, but she said to this patient, it didn't work. You, you know, this. I could have given you some estrogen and it would have been okay. She said, well, why I don't. You? She said, I, you didn't offer that to me and I don't want oral hormones. I told you I didn't want oral pills because I don't want to have it go through my liver and make other things. I understand that part, first pass effect. This patient was very well read yeah. and she read my book. So she then said to her doctor, I, I don't understand why you didn't want me to do this because I'm healthier. I've lost weight. My blood pressure's down. I'm off all my drugs. I, you know, look at me. I look different. And the doctor said, because it's dangerous. 
And she said, every parameter of health I now have. Mm. So when the, they agreed to disagree about this, and the reason the doctor said was she w- that she wouldn't do this or did, wouldn't recommend it is because she was afraid for her health. And then my patient got up on the table and said, well, it's time for my pap smear. And that doctor said, oh, we don't do pap smears on people over 60 anymore. Why not? Well, the American College of OBGYN says we don't need to. She said, am I not at risk for cervical cancer? Well, yes, you're still at risk for cervical cancer. Aren't I at risk for cervical cancer the older I get? Well, yeah. Then why are you not doing my pap smear if you're so worried about my health? Well, we need a certain percentage of you to die off culturally. Well, I'm sure that this physician Maybe your turn. was not thinking that. But I'm well, sure yeah. the American College probably was. I don't know. Because they're trying to contain costs and co- the, and the cheapest thing is dying, of course. But mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, truly, that when they say you don't need a mammogram, all I can say is that's how I find breast cancer. The only way to treat breast cancer and to, to actually conquer it right. is early detection. So that is a way to save lives. And when they tell you you don't need them over a certain age, that means they don't care about our lives after that. Then when they say you don't need a pap smear after a certain age, that's it, you know something what? It that's detected. must be a girl thing because they don't tell guys the older you get, the less you need a prostate exam. No, they don't. But they were trying to or limit. No, they were trying to limit your PSAs for a while. Yeah, they're trying to prove that PSAs didn't show anything. It is a screening test. It doesn't show. Right. I mean, it is it is uh, positive in many times when like prostatitis and infection or or sex or. So they've been challenging the accuracy challenging, of the PSA right. test, but not the need to have one in terms of uh, prostate cancer being a risk, and that's still the, the best way to determine if you're at risk. At least to start the ball rolling on, right. in terms of, of looking so, at So you. they don't say that to men, but no, apparently but they do is, say to women, you know, you, you're beyond the age of concern now. We don't need to test you anymore. But with testosterone, we are very functional and productive all the way through our lives. We don't have to stop living and be a drain on society. So they should rethink this again. If we were well, all taking testosterone, they are, they are then we would no longer you're be there. a drain to society. So we can produce, so they should give us the same uh, the same kind of uh, attention that they give men of any age. And they are doing that. You are the leading edge of a wave that is growing. And I need help. I need more people who are on, the, yeah, on that get wave. In the boat. Yeah. Um, we need to wrap this up. So we're going to close by saying if you are intrigued by the conversation that we've had today, one of the best resources that you can go to for information is the book that Dr. Moppin and I have written mm-hmm. called The Secret Female Hormone. There are checklists and discussions and dialogues about all of these points to go through and then take to your physician. And if your physician is skeptical, give them the book, give them the information, and say, I want to check this out. Leave it in their office, because there's some doctors that won't even take the book. Yeah. I've had patients say, I brought it to them, I handed it to them, he wouldn't take it. Just leave it on their desk. They'll get curious and start reading it. So, be aware, be involved, take part. Thank you very much. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the BioBalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BioBalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash BioBalanceHealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.